Okay, so my name is Amisa, Amisa Rashid. I usually say my name is Amisa with an A because it's my identity. I'm a Kenyan Nubian and we are an ethnically minority, a marginalized group. So I usually have to say that. So my name is Amisa Rashid. I am the founder and executive director of Nivishe Foundation. Yes. And that Nivishe, Nivishe is a Swahili word. It basically means to cover you. So we basically offer, we cover you, not by giving you clothes, but by offering dignified, affordable, accessible, and culturally sensitive mental health services at the community levels. So that is basically what we do. We started at 2019, and uh, yeah, we are here until now. I think growing up, as I said, it, it, it goes back to my background. Being a Nubian, majority of Nubians live in Kibra. Kibra was an, it's, it's the indigenous homeland of the Nubians. And that means that uh, before urbanization, it was our community, but due to urbanization, it became an informal settlement, a slum, basically. And that means that when you're growing in a slum and you're a marginalized community, this is what a lot of Kenyans don't know, is that even accessing basic services like uh, public health or other things is hard mm -hmm. because, one, you need ID and uh, Nubians don't have the privilege of accessing IDs like any other Kenyans easily. So that means that it is hard for us to access these types of services, especially mental health services at the community level. So that was one. But the other caveat was because I am a Muslim as well, and um, I lost my dad in 2014. And one thing that I realized within the Muslim community, we want we are not taught on different ways to grieve in a Sharia based way. So it really made me like um, go back into studying uh, counseling psychology and a lot of mental health and neuroscience so that I could be able to found the Nivishe to be able to offer these services for everybody at the community level. But the main key is cultural sensitivity. When you look at mental health, you realize that a lot of mental health intervention from Kenya or Africa is from the Western ideology, the conventional Western approach. You don't have community-based mental health approaches. So my work is more of how can we learn about community-based mental health approaches, which are cultural sensitive. If I'm a Muslim, maybe an intervention that will work for me, uh, considering my culture. If I'm from another tribe, another ethnicity, something of the same, just to make sure that we are not just borrowing everything, but we have the cultural sensitivity. I'm being different in the work that I do because, first of all, um, I don't like using that word, but I usually say I'm a woman of very many firsts, but I'm a woman of very many firsts because of also my community. I, a woman of very many firsts means that uh, we run mental health organization. I think we are the, among the main mental health organizations in the country. As much as we are based, uh, we are working with informal settlements and rural areas around the country. The other aspect is that um, I use my identity to make sure that we are seen and we are heard. Like the in places where that I'm based, because I sit in several boards. Like globally, I sit in. I'm the co-chair of Rise, which is a U.S.-based organization that deals with movement building. Um, I sit at Restless Development Global Board. Um, Several in Kenya, I, I see, I'm the currently chair of the board of directors of Young Women Leadership Institute, a uh, previous board member of CSO Place. So all these opportunities, it has given me, and the awards and accolades has given me an opportunity to be able to amplify the needs of people in vulnerable community, informal settlements, and also the plea of my people, the Nubian and other marginalized communities. In 2020, 2020, the Nubian Council of Elders gave me an award, like a sort of certification of the community work that I do. So for me, it's it's not global like the others or regional or national, but for me, the fact that my community can be able to see what I was doing and be able to recognize it and award me for it. So that was like, it's special to me until now because most of the time it's, a prophet is never welcomed in his homeland. So for them, they told me actually that we want to remove that narrative. You're doing work for our community and we're here to recognize that and support you on the way. So that is my, my most passionate, okay. yeah. Good question. For mental health, actually because it is behavior changing, it's hard to measure success in the conventional way. 
So what we do is we measure success by the number of people that we work with each year. So I can say we have our mental health fellowship. Our mental health fellowship actually usually have 50 to 100 fellows a, 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 twice a year by annually. And before a fellow graduates, they have to go back to their community, identify a mental health issue, and uh, do what work with 200 a minimum of 200 people in their community so from the last cohort we had directly worked with around uh, 60 70 fellows and that means that their community level they were, they, they had to reach to 20000 individuals so that is how we uh, we quantify we go to like our work also involves advocacy and advocacy means that uh, we are telling people about mental health so we go to all radio station, community radio station and whatnot. So we quantify that through listenership. And if people come and we ask them, where did you hear about it? They tell us through radio station. We can be able to say, okay, this number of people know are advocating our advocacy impact is this because of this number of people who listen and they've been able to reach out. We have mental health clubs. we partnered with several schools. We, we worked with, uh, we have um, t mental health and psychosocial support for teen mothers and young mothers. Uh, adolescent girl programs and community outreaches. So in a year, typically, we usually reach around 10 to 15,000 individuals directly at the community level. That is just directly. And then we usually reach around, uh, and, and that is women and girls only. And then we usually reach around uh, five to 10,000 youth in general and other community members. Even us mental health people need help. So one thing I ensure that for me and my team, because my team, most of them as much as the different professional are mental health advocates or professions. So that means that we have, we, there's a way in which we put self-care first. So that means that if you're not able to take in a client or a patient, you can be able to refer. See your asthma. Because you don't need to deal with somebody when your mental health is compromised. So that is one. The other aspect is um, we have a community. So we make sure that a counselor, if I was a counselor, I need a counselor to be brief. So we do not allow our team of counselors or mental health um, professions to go and see people if they don't have their own counselors. Because that means that you just be absorbing, 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 and there's no release. And there has to be absorb and release. So we, I have to make sure that. So I think my essence is I protect my team and make sure they are healthy mentally and then they can be able to protect the community we are serving. So my team is, uh, we are 10 full-time staff and around 15 volunteers and interns. And um, yeah, so and our board directors are seven of them. So that is like the whole team. Yes. No, we spread across or we work. <laughs> we spread. It's just that here is our Kibra is home. Kibra is what initiated, sprouted this. Yes. So that is where we are here. But uh, we work in a lot of informal settlements because the next five to ten years, we know we'll be having centers or mobile centers in all the areas that we work. So we work across Nairobi informal settlements, schools in Nairobi uh, and rural areas uh, because also our fellows work come from different parts of the country. So we are, we are actually evenly distributed. Currently, we're also going to work with Sudan youth because of the war that is happening. So we want to offer them our fellowship. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our work also extends to working with other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. What I usually say is that our work is not to judge, our work is to help. Mm -hmm. So whichever person comes, our mandate first is to help and then think about the other things aside. Because I think with here, and yes, sometimes you'll find that you're exploited, but the funny part is that we, we don't get exploited by the people we serve. Mm -hmm. We get exploited by big organizations when they want to conduct research or what, all these kind of things. But our mandate is we serve people first. And then if we find out, because we have safeguarding policy, we'll figure it out. But will help whoever who comes. To be honest, I usually say like running an organization is the hardest thing. It's not easy and sometimes even my board and mentors can tell you. Sometimes I usually feel like I want to give up and they just go and look for job because I have a good CV. So I usually tell myself if I go outside there, I'll do, I'll do like get a good job. But I think it's my community. I'm really passionate about my community and the calling because with mental health, there's, it is such a huge thing that we don't know even the smallest intricacies of it. So I think now, and I'm passionate about it. Mm. Now I've grown the passion. It's hard, but we're just continuing with it. Okay. 
the price I'm paying for the passion is uh I wanted to say my mental well being, but nowadays I take care of my mental well being well. So it's not my mental well being. The price I pay for this uh, passion is um I think time because I don't have like when you are the um, I'm the executive director, mm -hmm. I'm also the main resource mobilizer of my organization. So that means that I have zero, zero personal time and zero other time for yeah, so that time. It has been two years. I have not have serious burnouts. Yeah. So nowadays I make sure I don't work on Sundays. Small, small things like I don't work on Sundays. I go to gym every day. Um, I I don't work in an environment that I'm not able to work. Mm -hmm. Like most of the time you'll find that I'm not in the office. So I find places whereby I can be able to be more productive and just work well. Yeah. yeah. For, for my organization, one thing I'm excited about is having our own center. Like I'm really excited for us because at least it will be our first center which we are envisioning it not to be that center of um, just center counseling rooms, but a center of, um, we'll design it. So I'm just looking forward to, to, to it. And then uh, for the future of mental health, we are progressing at a total speed, but at least we are moving. Nowadays, if I go and speak about mental health, people understand it. Yeah. I think one thing that it's doing is one, constant education. Yeah. Like I'm always in school doing a course or doing something. Because for me, with mental health, the way we say it, it's evolving. And even my, my, my aspect as a leader, like our organization is also growing and all these kind of things. So I'm constantly trying to grow myself through education through fellowship through all these kind of things but also i have mentors yeah. like i think one of where i am today i'm not lying to you i will not be here without my mentors these are individuals who whichever part of my journey that i'm taking it's yeah. easier for them to support me mm -hmm. because at least they've been through that path now even if i'm looking for the future it's easier for me because these are people who are able to hold my hand yeah. so i think uh what is that being constantly finding knowledge and just being educated mm. and just knowing yeah. education is different than knowledge okay mm. and then uh, having a mentor okay. mentors my superpower is that i am a people's person mm. i love people i love community i love laughing yeah. and uh, so that is my superpower because in whichever place i go I find warmth and be able, and this is very essential for me because mental health for so long has been stigmatized. So when I have this um, personality or this way, this charisma way in which if I enter a room, I can be able to change your perception for that. Ah, and the other one I've remembered, I can be able to break down big concepts to very small concepts that even a child, somebody who does not understand English can be able to understand. So that has really helped in breaking down mental health knowledge. Okay. Mm. If I could tell you one thing, I'll just say take, live a day at a time. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, live a day at a time because as much as we plan, as much as whatever we do in life, all those kind of things, at the end of the day, it comes to where you are at the moment and what decision you're making. So you may plan for tomorrow, but tomorrow is not promised. So live for today, work for today, and show up for today.